the final lecture in international human rights. I'll call this critical thinking, human rights, human nature, and politics. Language is very important. T.S. Eliot once talked about what it meant to purify the dialect of the tribe. And when language is used, as it often is in the human rights world and in the culture wars we live with these days, to undermine meaningful critical thinking in the language of human rights did emerge understandably so, as an attempt to think critically about, one, the abuses of language and also the abuse of people uh, who were powerless in the midst of others who were much more powerful taking advantage of them. But language and critical thinking are very important. And in the midst, often, of human rights clashes in the culture wars, language becomes reduced to a form of silencing opposition and critical thinking then is tossed out the window in the process. Let me use a variety of illustrations to illuminate this point. We were to move, for example, to Israel and the Palestinians. Often what happens when criticisms of Israel take place the way of opposing that is to use the language of anti-Semitism. No one wants to be anti-Semitic in a period of post-Holocaust thinking. And so this way of thinking is uh, silences thought. It undermines critical thinking about both the complex natures of the Jews in Israel themselves, as well as the diasporic Jews. It uh, undermines any form of Palestinian, Muslim, secular, or Christian in critiquing it. Because if one sees oneself immediately anti-Semitic by critiquing Israel, then that heads down a pathway uh, in which the memories of the Holocaust come up again. And so here's a form of language. And if a Jew critiques their own people, they're called a Jew hater. Now, which Jew wants to be known as one who hates their own people? And so you can see how language is employed here uh, to undermine critical thinking by, in that sense, seeing the one who thinks critically as the problem. And so this becomes highly problematic. Another language which is often thrown, this is more um, a certain contingency within the Muslim community, from those who dare to critique particularly extreme wings of it, the jihadist, uh, they're often accused of Islamophobic. Who wants to be called Islamophobic? And so what happens inevitably is that when language like Islamophobic is throwing at people, it's, it's a way of silencing uh, opposition and asking critical questions about healthy Muslim communities, those who are engaged in critiquing their own tradition in a meaningful manner, more liberal forms of Islam, centrist forms of Islam, soft right forms of Islam, and extreme forms uh, of Islam that understand jihad is, is, is literal uh, forms of violence in terms of opposition to their own people and then other traditions. So when the language is tossed out of Islamic phobic, particularly in a world of multiculturalism and pluralism and diversity, it almost becomes, um, well, not almost, it is, it is a form of silencing any form of legitimate questioning of the abuses of, of a religion itself, just as the language of anti-Semitism does exactly the same thing. In the United States, often those who dare to critique elements of American foreign policy uh, can be called uh, anti-patriotic or anti-nationalist. It would be similar in Canada if people critique Canadian foreign policy and we're called anti-Canadian or Canadianophobic uh, in that sense. We don't apply that way of thinking uh, to, say, Canada uh, in terms of legitimate place of critical thinking but it's in the culture wars this, this often happens. We can see the same thing being played out today in terms of some of the issues going on with the language of systemic racism. 
tossed out anyone who uh, and the danger of course is in, in this is the notion that all blacks think the same all asians think, think the same all indigenous people think the same uh, so what you have underneath this is a, a homogenous notion of a community uh, rather than all communities and this is what human rights of course is is about it's recognizing that all communities are diverse there's complexity. You can have people uh, who are on the right, the center, on the left, in all, all communities. Uh, but when critical thinking uh, is marginalized and people think in just large categories of homogenous groups, uh, then, of course, what, what inevitably happens is language is tossed around like a frisbee but loses any meaning. And this is what the dilemma of the media is about because most me forms of media, whether the right or the left, they're very much they're what we call parachute journalists. They parachute into an area. They have no sense of the context, the history, the people, the community. Uh, they end up interviewing one or two people, and out of that we get um, media reports of conflictual, tragic areas, but with no sense of historic context whatsoever. And so the were things like systematic racism is bandied about as if it's the answer and the way of making sense of very problematic historic situations and contemporary situ situations. Um, systematic relations, system, systematic structures that lead to racism, often this, this language itself uh, distorts reality in many ways. Systematic racism or structural racism in that sense is what you would get, for example, in apartheid uh, South Africa under the Afrikaners and which built into the education, the, re the religion, the legal system is a certain understanding of the white's role in society, the colored's role in society, and the black. That's a structure, that's a system that precludes certain people because of ethnicity and color from being having access to the goods of a society. Uh, the blacks in the United States, uh, before the coming and the impact of the civil rights movement, that was structural racism in which blacks could not uh, eat in certain restaurants with whites. They couldn't go to the same schools, or if they did go to schools, they were black schools. So the whole um, equal but different mentality is structural racism. And so to understand what structural systemic racism is, it's quite different than what actually is going on today, which is closer to what we would call anecdotal racism. Or there is, uh, there is a form of certainly implicit structural racism in certain communities, police force, but does that mean the police forces themselves are structurally racist? Well, to argue that way, you would have to have built right into their policy that, in fact, certain peoples are the ones that have to be treated as subhuman or underhuman in some ways, and other people are better than that. So language, again, um, are there structures that lead to racism? Well, of course there are structures that lead, but is North America structurally racist? This is a question that has to be you know, pondered, and the language has to be broken down much more carefully, or it leads to hysteria and overreactions to uh, complex facts and complex histories, which uh, have to be parsed a little more carefully. The dilemma of language being used in a certain way, and we find this again in social justice warriors who have a a, a, a list of issues which they see as significant and anyone who dares to differ with them is silenced. And of course, in that particular approach, uh, the rights of those who ask critical questions are undermined and hence the free speech movement that emerges out of the right. And so the same with the language of the whole movement, what we call blacks, indigenous, and people of color, the BIPOC. Now, are all blacks, are all indigenous people, are all people of color, um, do they all think the same? Do they all have the same exact identical history? Uh, well, of course they don't. And the language of human rights is very, very much about honoring uh, and protecting complex individuals and communities from overarching interpretations or ideological interpretations that are not true to the complexity of the human heart, the human soul, and human society, and human history itself. 
So within the liberal tradition itself, the language of rights uh, exists as a means of protecting both critical thinking and complex realities that in the midst of the culture wars, the danger that we face is people simplify complex social realities. They simplify interpretations of the past. They simplify through pop media, which tends to be, as I mentioned earlier, uh, parachute journalism, just dropping into a situation without no substantive analysis, which plays into the use of language in a certain way that distorts reality, but it gets constant attention, it whips up interests, it divides people, it polarizes, and the purpose of rights is, at its deepest is meant to bring people together to overcome a way of thinking uh, that is much more about justice making and peacemaking in that sense. Uh, but when certain interpretations dominate in the media frenzy, which is in a sense a parasite of melodrama, it constantly plays on intense melodramatic situations, by, but also but not giving the complex history, it undermines the whole purpose of rights and why rights exist. And rights is a form of counterculture resistance against the caricaturing of reality itself. And so in a course in introduction, uh, and particularly international human rights, it's very important to understand that, um, that language can be used in a way, and often is used in a way, that distorts reality. It simplifies interpretations into black and white Manichaean categories but thereby it prevents the whole purpose of rights from fulfilling its end. I might just conclude by saying that underneath the language of rights is, of course, the bigger question of human nature itself. Um, now, the danger in looking at rights and socialization and enculturation in history is that people end up ignoring the complex nature of human nature itself and so things get reduced then to ethnic issues, uh, people of color, people of race and so identity then is defined by what race a person grows up, either they're powerful in that race or the victim of that race. Um, and so with identity and race and class and many of these forms of defining what right should be, what often is missed in the process is the fact that people are much deeper than what they are born into and their history themselves. And that's where human nature is foundational. And this is why the language of rights also delves and probes into the complex uh, reality of human nature in which regardless of race, class, color of skin, upbringing, humans can move in two directions with suffering, with victimization. If they were once powerless, they get power, then they can use power to make others powerless. Uh, once victimized, they can use power, one in power, to victimize others. And so there is this dark side of human nature. Um, it goes right back to, well, any great civilizations understand it, whether it's the Greeks or whether it's the Chinese or Middle Eastern, African, uh, any of these cultures understand one element of human nature is the egoistic, the narcissistic, the self-defensive wing. Uh, the other wing is, in fact, people who have suffered. They've been through painful experiences. And yet out of that, on the anvil of their pain, of their tragedy and the suffering, good emerges and they become healers and uniters in the world order itself. And so it is this tension within human nature that underlies the, the whole elements of a person's birth and color of skin, uh, culture, ethnicity, and history that goes much deeper in, into the human condition it, itself that needs to be probed. And human rights are very much about uh, recognizing, of course, there is class, there is ethnicity, there is race, there is color of skin, there is language, there is history. But how people deal with that 
uh, says much about what part of themselves they're listening to, whether the shadow, the dark side, whether they have been victims of oppression, how will they uh, move beyond that when they themselves become people of power or of privilege and others some will go obviously in a direction of vindication, of revenge, of anger, of taking out on others. Whereas those like the Nelson Mandela's, the Dalai Lama's, the Martin Luther King's, uh, leaders within First Nations community, they transcend. They, they know how to transcend their hurts, their pains, their sufferings, their tragedies for yet a greater good in binding together their own communities and then the bigger communities of people on, in the world itself. And that's always the promise of human rights, but there's often the peril of human rights itself and much changes on how, what people listen to in terms of their own experiences, how they interpret it and then how they apply it. Uh, both within their own communities and to those who they feel uh, who have taken advantage of them within history. Human rights then is an idealist vision of what can be, but often people shrink to uh, a vindictive, reactive approach to legitimate hurts, but how one deals with tragedy and suffering will determine how rights are understood, applied, and the implications of that for a greater unity of the human journey or a more fractured, fragmented, and polarized understanding of the human journey.